Mina, Ohio Gazimash, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. I'm coming at you with another 30 minute message. I know it's a little bit uh, unusual to do multiple 30 minute messages multiple days in a row, but according to a little document I have here, I missed some stuff back in the day. So some messages, some long messages were due. So I'm trying to, I guess you could say, make up for that. I'm trying to. I'm trying to come back and say, you know what, let me go ahead and make up for some of the lost time, some of the lost things that I did not do. So, 30 minute message, here we go. And honestly, I, I can ramble fairly easily. Um, I say that, and yet these things do take a few hours of preparation. I can't just pull 30 minutes out of thin air. I guess if I was just pure rambling about whatever was on my mind, I could, but to have an organized and semi-focused message with definite points that are all under one major point, I can't just pull that out of thin air. Um, it'd be sweet if I was that good, um, but I have to be, even if I, I was like, even if I did something like that, it would be something that I'd been meditating on for probably the last few days, or something that just really hit me like a ton of bricks and like, one that one piece of the puzzle that you needed to fit those four or five pieces together boom there it is now it all makes sense but short of that um, a message requires planning and prep so I've been busy the last few days trying to put these things out but at the same time I want to make up for the lost time I want to make up for the things that I had not done in the past so here it is or here's one of them anyway Yesterday, I talked about your sphere of influence, your sphere of ministry, your sphere of evangelism, the people that God wanted you to reach and reach out to. I thought about that, and I was, I've, I, I've had in mind for a while, you know, need to do some extra messages. But here, um, the 30-minute message was like, you know, I'll take a little bit of time to throw together another 30-minute message because I feel like there was quite a bit that I could say that I did not say yesterday. And there was there are some things in regards to ministry and evangelism, and you can kind of lump in discipleship with that, that simply was not said yesterday. Yesterday I talked about the spheres in which we did it. Um, going from, it starts with like your city, your personal area, your Jerusalem, the country you live in, your Judea, neighboring nations, you're starting to reach out a little bit. Um, that would be your Samaria, than the entire world, like literally traveling to foreign countries that are far away, and how even if individuals are not all called to do that, and I don't, I don't think the even the majority. I could be wrong in this, and I don't really have any Bible verses to support me, or to support the other side. But I don't personally believe that a majority of the church is called to be like a missionary and to go across the seas and to travel to foreign lands and foreign peoples. <clears throat> But the church as a whole, <clears throat> the church of every nation, should be world-minded. Um, believe it or not, I, I'll just, this isn't the main point of today, but it's something I didn't cover yesterday. I'm leading into today's message, so this isn't a complete tangent. Did you know that there are missionaries in this country from other countries? There are actually missionaries from, like, Africa and... That's the only, that's the I, I know some definite preachers, um, some missionaries from Africa who've come to the United States to evangelize us, and that might sound kind of weird, but at the same time I would definitely say that we need. I'm pretty sure other countries have done it as well, and it's not just one or two. There are there are a handful of countries that have sent missionaries to the United States because they recognize America's decline in Christian morality and ethics, um, in Christian beliefs. They see that. So they come over here, and they're not necessarily seeking a better life. They actually want to minister to us. Now, do some of them have shady motives? Probably some of them do. Um, I don't think I need to tell anybody about the televangelists that have existed in the past and some of the horrible things that they've done. I don't need to mention that, even though I just did, right? But obviously, some people do things for bad motives. But I'm referring to, there's some, from what I can tell, Genuinely good people who are like America's Christianity is on decline. We want to help the American church. We want to. We think we have something we can contribute to the work, to the conversation. So we're going to come over and help. America is by far at the current moment, um, and was in the 20th century as well, the leading country to send evangelists. Or I, I 
I was like, missionary is the popular term, evangelist is the more biblical term to other countries. They're deliberately going to these other countries, usually non-Christian countries, and even that's a bit of a, an interesting term to use, I'll cover that in a second, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their ministry is primarily evangelism. And even yesterday I mentioned how our work, it should include more than evangelism. It should include, you know, loving people and helping people, the church, and the people who just aren't interested in Jesus. We should still love them. We should still help them. We should still minister to them. Although evangelism is the primary work. So really, missionaries, the biblical term there would be evangelist. Yes, they are there to help with other things, but the primary work is to go to those people and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reason I say non-Christian nations, here in America, we have a very unique set of circumstances where the vast majority of our founding fathers were Christians. And even the reason this nation was set up was to have religious independence, which um, Europe and e England specifically at the time would not allow. They wanted to enforce their brand of Christianity. Well, the Founding Fathers were Christians, but they had beliefs that differed from the main church. So they wanted their own independent churches. Um, one of a bunch of different religions, it was Christianity. But they wanted their denominations to not suffer, you know, imprisonment, fines, and even torture and death. Um, and that, uh, that's a, Christians abusing other Christians, that's another message for another time altogether. But they wanted a nation where they could worship Jesus specifically in their own flavor, in their own way. And that was a big motivating factor for the founding of America. So, essentially, America was founded as a Christian nation, for the most part. I would dare say, you know, England, over time, as it metamorphosed, it also became a Christian nation. There were several nations that didn't start out as Christian nations that eventually Christianity became the main religion of that land. America was founded on Christianity. It didn't become that way. It started that way. And I do personally believe, from the evidence that I've looked at, that that is the Christian idea and worldview is one of the main reasons America has become the most powerful and most free nation in the world today. I'm not trying to be overly patriotic here. I am trying to be as unbiased as possible in stating these facts. I really do love my country. And it's not just because, you know, America, heck yeah. It's because I see the way this country was founded. I see the principles, however muddied they may be, that still exist today. I'm like, America really is a great place. I am very thankful that I'm an American citizen and that I live in America. It's a pretty awesome place. I'm very thankful to be here and to have been raised here. Even though I didn't get a, a, a Christian upbringing, um, Jesus eventually found me, and the church eventually found me. I eventually gave my life over. They were looking in their Jerusalem. They were looking in their territory, and they were trying to help. And it is good for the church in general to be aware of the other nations of the world and try to take Christ to the nations that weren't founded on him or not majority Christian, or, as like those um, few African missionaries that I mentioned, even sending them to a majority Christian nation because there are still some things that could definitely be uh, polished and fine-tuned here in America. If, you watched, if you've watched um, any of my other messages, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about from my personal point of view. Now, the question that has to be asked, once you've committed yourself to saying, okay, I'm going, you know, I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to disciple. I'm going to try to do, you know, the Jesus thing, the Christian thing within my sphere of influence, within the little the the little realm that I have to myself. You know, I'm going to start in my Jerusalem. I'll keep the others in mind, but especially in my Jerusalem where I directly live, I am going to be Jesus to the people I meet, to the lost and to the saved, to the church and to the unchurched. What I'd like to present today, and some parts of this message are going to be rough. What I want to present, <laughs> you have been warned right there. It's, granted, it was nine minutes into the message, but before I head into it, you have been warned. There is a cost. Once you've committed yourself to doing the Christian thing and to living like Jesus wants you to live, there's a cost that needs to be weighed in with that. A lot of the times, we don't know going in everything exactly that we're going to be facing once we decide, hey, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give Jesus to the people around me. I'm going to live like Jesus. 
um, where I'm at in life, and I'm going to pursue His will for my life and do my best to spread Christianity in the world because we want we want to populate heaven. We want heaven full. We want heaven. We want hell empty. Once you commit to that, your life is going to be different. It's going to change. There is a cost to be paid. I did not look up this message, this particular scripture in ahead of time, so this can be the homework for this 30-minute message. Jesus told a story. I'll give you a hint. It's in the Gospel of Luke. And he told the story of someone who started building a building, a tower. They got about halfway, and they stopped because they simply ran out of materials. And you know, they, you know, people made fun of them. They became a laughing stock because they weren't able to finish what they built. And the moral behind that parable, which I think is exclusive to Luke, actually, before you build something, you need to count the cost. That's very important. You can't just, kind of like these messages, unless I've been brewing and stirring over something for several days or something just fits in place, I can't just pop out a 30-minute message, a fully prepared message. Like I do the, the quick messages every day just because I read the Bible. I'm like, huh. I wonder what you know. I wonder what I can give to the people out of the chapter that I've read. And sometimes, honestly, that's taken an hour or two. Just like you know, what point should I cover? How will this make sense? How can I say it in a way I haven't said it before? Even those take time, guys. Um, I I try not to just I try not to waste my time or yours with these messages. I try to have something relevant, whether it's long or whether it's short. But there is a price to be paid once you're committed to living the Christian life. Now I want to discuss that. Today I want to give you guys some um, I want to give you guys some thoughts to chew on a little bit. It's not all going to be pleasant, but the truth, regardless of its taste, will set you free. I'm going to I'm going to kick it off um, a little bit on the easy side. We're going to go to Galatians chapter two. Galatians chapter two. I, yeah, I'm flipping around it here. Verses seven and eight. Galatians chapter two, verses seven and eight. But on the contrary. When they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. For he who worked effectively in Peter, for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Now the circumcised are the Jews, the uncircumcised are the Gentiles. That's what that means. So Peter was to the Jews, Paul was to the Gentiles. Now the point I draw from that. I find it very unusual and a little counterintuitive that Peter, the rough-and-tumble boat guy, went to the very religious, very devout Jews, and Paul, the Pharisee, knew the law back and forth. Um, I believe he was instructed by Gamaliel, if I recall correctly. Um, feel free to Google behind me and see who his instructor was. It is recorded biblically. Um, almost, I am pretty much positive it was Gamaliel. This Pharisee was sent to the Gentiles, the, the rather uncouth and uneducated group. Wouldn't Paul be much more trained and efficient in ministering to the very religious, very devout Jewish nation? They already had a foundation for God, and here, you know, Paul, he, he was a Pharisee. He knew the law in and out. Peter, from what I could tell, he knew the law in and out just being raised as a Jewish boy. But he was very, very rough around the edges, very outspoken. Um, as a fisherman, I get the feet. I could be wrong in this, but I get the feeling as a fisherman, he had no problem facing danger. He had no problem facing the unknown. Um, you know, you go out on the open seas every single day, or at least, or on the open water. And the Sea of Galilee, if you look it up, uh, storms rise up there like in an instant, like that. So it could actually be quite treacherous where he fished on a daily basis. He had to be ready for pretty much anything. He sounds like more of the adventurous type. So it strikes me as counterintuitive that Peter went to the Jews and Paul went to the Gentiles. But God's plans are not our plans. God knows stuff about us that we don't know. And he also loves to take the things that look like they would work for us and flip them on their head and say, uh, -uh guess what, guys? I'm going to do it this way. Bet you didn't see that coming, did you? And then when he does that, all the more glory goes to him because, you know what? That really shouldn't have worked, but it did. God was probably behind that one, and thus he gets a bit more glory. He'd get glory either way, but the th and beyond that part, 
he knows where we're best suited. He knows what we're going to be uh, more than anything else. To give uh, my personal story on this, I, I'd like to think it shows in my videos. I seem to be much more teaching oriented. I seem to be very, I, I tend to be systematic in my way of thinking. I tend to have a very set way about going, um, about establishing my theology, about establishing the way I think about setting up my worldview of things, and I tend to be fairly articulate when I communicate. When people hear me, most of the time they get where I'm coming from, they see what I'm saying, and I, because I tend to be very detailed when I speak, and I, de and I plan fairly meticulously when I put these messages together. Like I said, these 30-minute messages, I do tend to ramble, and I tend to speak pretty well, and that certainly helps with a 30-minute message or any elongated message on um, 10 minutes. I think 10 minutes or more can actually be counted as a speech. I don't know if there's a rule to that, but anyway, it still takes time to prepare for that. But I'm able to prepare for that. I'm able to put these things together. I'm able to line them up. They make sense. And I'll say for the most part, people would tend to agree with my assessment of myself that I tend to be pretty good at teaching. I tend to be pretty good at articulating what it is I need to say, at you know making my points and making them understood. Even if you disagree with me, you can at least see where I'm coming from. It makes sense. And a lot of people have told me, dude, you should, you should go to like a theology school and just teach. Be a teacher or a professor there. You'd be good at it. I think I would be good at it. But God has consistently throughout my entire life, called me into just more personal ministry, um, pastoral stuff, youth-related stuff. Um, even here, here on YouTube, I feel like the audience, especially for video gaming, is it's much younger, middle to high school, some college. And of course, there are older guys like myself who absolutely love the stuff. But it tends to be the younger audience that is drawn to video games. And I tend to be very vivacious um, and very um, energized when I do stuff. And that's, and a lot of my friends would also say just plain old immature. Eh. So that, that just kind of, um, it's just kind of a part of who I am. And I still think, I, I still see where I'd be a good teacher, but God's consistently wanted me to be with people, to do pastoral type stuff, maybe some evangelistic type stuff. Not that te obviously teaching would be a huge boon um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to preach. Um, it, it, the message, is very it, it tends to be very instructive, very systematized, very point by point, very logic and reason driven. And that's certainly helpful. But instead of being a teacher somewhere, finding myself doing more pastoral things. And honestly, guys, that's probably not what I would have chosen offhand. But when I pray about it and I seek the Lord on it, what I feel led to do, I feel like I'd be good at teaching. I, it, it looks like that's what I should do. And I feel like I'd be good at it. But where I feel led by the Spirit is the pastoral type stuff. More personal type stuff. Not just standing behind some pedagogue somewhere and you know speaking of, you know, from the top of an ivory tower, but rather just getting down among the masses, you know, hanging out with people, I'm having fun with people, and ministering the gospel there. I feel like that's where the Lord wants me. And I would say for the most part that, you know, that I have a lot of growing still to be done, and I certainly have not arrived by any means, but I'd say for the most part, it's, I've had some successes there. I've done that part well, and I've also enjoyed it. It's been, it's been stretching at times, but it's been good for me. It's actually been very, very good for me. So I'm not exactly where I thought I would be. And then... Then there are times when the Lord will place you where you do not want to be at all. Right now I'm flipping over to the book of Daniel. Because the area where he was essentially called to minister certainly is not something he himself would have chosen. I'm going to start with Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, and I'm going to read from there. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Skipping down to verse 6, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. What was going on at this time? Well, actually, let me just back up to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Daniel's city fell. It was conquered. He lost his nation. Who knows what he lost personally? And he's taken captive and forced to work for this foreign king who renames him after a foreign god. If you look at their original names, all of their names glorified the biblical, um, the biblical Jewish God. The names that they were given in Babylon glorified some or were based on some pagan god. And that, that was his ministry environment. That's where he was called to be. The Bible doesn't record it. It's hard, and as faithful and as God-loving as he was, it's hard for me to believe that he didn't have a few nights where he was wondering what the heck was going on. He, he knew why the heck was happening. He was apparently a God-fearing man from the very beginning, so I'm sure he listened to the prophets, heard of the destruction of the city. But I wonder how many nights he cried himself to sleep. I wonder how many nights he was sad, depressed, alone. It's really hard for me to believe that he was just fine and dandy and had no problems whatsoever. And he just, you know, joy and peace of the Lord all the way through and everything was fine. And the reason I say this is because I haven't seen a single godly man. And I've, I've met some really, really great Christian people who love God, who serve God consistently, who have been with God from their youth and really haven't had like a falling away period. They've been for decades consistent in their walk with the Lord. And they have bad days. They've had rough times. There have been things, once you get to know them personally, once you're not just looking at the broad scope, the big picture, which as detailed and as honest as the Bible is about its hero's downfalls, it's still the highlights. It's still the highlight rule. It's still the big stories. You don't get to see the day-to-day -day and the little emotions. You don't get to see that. And everyone has their down days and their down moments. This guy lost his nation probably several loved ones, had his name changed, and now he has to serve this king with all these pagan beliefs, pagan gods, pagan rituals, who essentially wants to de-Jew-ize him and de god -ize him. It's good English right there, isn't it? And he had to face all that. He did have his three friends, but I bet there were several times when he was just like, God, I'm ready to fall apart. I'm ready to break. Please help. Apparently the Lord did help because he wound up being the chief of the wise men, even second of command, for, for the next two kings to come. He was incredibly highly esteemed, um, raised up to master of the wise men, raised to the third highest rank in the kingdom, and then had some ridiculously high rank. I said second in command, that may be incorrect, under the third ruler. So, for three kings, he was really, really high up. God had him where he wanted him, and God knew what he was doing. To bring a more recent case scenario into this, and one that's a bit disturbing. Um, I, it just, it, I was like, the story of Daniel it can definitely be disturbing when you think about the things that I just said, but the next story, just, it hits me a little bit harder, personally. I forget where I heard this. Um, I did just a little bit of research online before this message, and what I saw seemed to back up what I heard previously. But apparently... Um, a lot of the nations that I talked about earlier that became Christian over time, a lot of those were the Viking nations. The Viking nations over time converted to Christianity. They were very pagan, worshipped Thor and Odin and all those guys, which are great Marvel heroes, by the way. And, but by the way, those were actual gods that were actually worshipped. At one point, it wasn't fantasy, it wasn't fiction. People actually worshipped these gods, bowed down to them, offered sacrifices, lived according to those rules and those beliefs, etc. Those nations eventually gave way to Christianity, and Christianity became the main religion among those groups. And one of the ways Christianity got to those groups, uh, when the Vikings um, pillaged the English shores, they not only took a bunch of gold, silver, and precious stones, they took a lot of women as well. And those women became the wives and who knows what else 
of the uh, of the Vikings. They they were they they were I'm like <laughs> I, there's no way to say this nicely. They were used as sex toys. Some of them were married. Some of them were more than likely simply used um, for sexual reasons. I mean, that's one of the things that the old world did. Several nations still do to this day. You kill the men, you keep the women for sex. Um, sometimes just for sex slaves. They're not even so much as married. They're just sex slaves, and that's all they are. And these women in this completely foreign culture being raped day after day being given to a man, if they were lucky, probably in several cases they were multiple men, and they held on to their Christian faith. They didn't curse God. They didn't give up. Who knows how many of them converted over to the pagan gods and gave up, but some of them didn't. Some of them kept on believing in Jesus, and they insisted on worshiping their God, regardless of the circumstances surrounding them. I don't know how many of them saw their husbands or their children come to the Lord, but eventually, over a few hundred years, several human lifetimes, something that mere humans couldn't you know, effectively plan out or prepare for, several hundred years, those nations gave way to Christianity. Christianity won. There were certainly apostles and missionaries and evangelists sent and various saints and whatnot to these Viking nations. It wasn't just the women. But those women were a part of the overall plan. And they were part of what God used to bring his gospel, his light, and his salvation to a completely lost race. Not my idea of a good plan. And my first thought is, you know, it's not God's intention that anyone, you know, do violence um, and torture on another human being. That's never God's plan. But... Non-Christians are going to be non-Christians. Heathens are going to be heathens. Non-believers are going to be non-believers. They're not going to obey the laws and the ethics of the Bible. A lot of the ethics of the lost and the agnostic and even the atheists of this day are heavily influenced based on the Christian roots of this nation. The morality and the ideas that they have, and they're not they're not completely Christian. There are a lot of things they believe that Christians do not believe. They accept a lot of things Christians do not accept, but a good deal of their morality is still founded upon the ideas, ethics, and morals of America, which is a Christian nation. To this day, a, a vast majority still profess faith in God and Jesus in specific. How many believe it um, literally into the T? I don't know. <clears throat> but a lot of them profess it, so that idea of what's right and what's wrong is biblical for the most part. So the atheists and the agnostics the morality that they want to say that they have that's important to them. They're borrowing those ideas from the Bible. Um, for them, morality is completely relative, and they have nothing to really base that morality on. And that's a bit of a side point. But Christianity is the reason that those ethics and those morals exist. Um, the reason, you know, we consider murder, rape, and pillaging bad things, because the Bible, I'll say, despite what you want to say about the Old Testament supporting those things, when it actually does not... It, it, has some, it has some weird stories in it, but it never supports, it doesn't support the wholesale slaughter of, um, of just anybody and everybody who does not believe. It actually, believe it or not, does not support that. There were a lot of times, I was like, just the story of um, Naaman, um, a foreign general, coming to Elisha the prophet, and he didn't believe in God at all. He got healed, and all, hey, all of a sudden, he's a believer. So not everyone, and that's just one example, but not everyone in the Old Testament was like, kill the heathens. The idea of peace and loving your neighbor existed way before Jesus. Jesus simply took those ideas and said, by the way, this applies to the entire world, not just the Jews or the converts to the Jews. Everyone should live by these rules. And so these women, they live for Jesus where they were, and though I was like, just being being raped every day is like inconceivably horrible to me. And as a man, it's unlikely that I'll face a fate like that. It's possible, but it's unlikely. That's that is definitely a problem that women face more so than men. But they live for Jesus. They love Jesus right where they were, 
And over time, they were a leading contributor to what God was doing in the Vikings' lives. Guys, when you commit yourself to living for Jesus, you don't always know where life's going to lead you. You don't always know where God's going to lead you. Count the cost. Think about when you live for Jesus, it's like, kind of like what Jesus said. You can look this one up as well. It's in the Gospel of John. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Please keep that in mind. Suffering, denigration, cursing, that is one of the heritages of being a believer in Jesus Christ. And on that note, I'm actually going to encourage you, those of you who are not Christians, to believe in Jesus, to accept him as your Lord and Savior. It's not the easiest path, and the world does hate a lot of what Christianity stands for as a whole even though they tout some of the morals and ethics and they like to borrow some ideas, they still hate the Jesus behind it. They still hate the God behind it. I'm going to encourage you right now to accept this Jesus as Lord and Savior because even though the road is rough, it is worth it. And it's a lot better, I'm going to add at the end, to have a whole Christianity and not just bits and pieces that you've cherry-picked. The agnostics and atheists like to accuse us Christians of cherry-picking the parts of the Bible that we like, well, they cherry pick the parts of morality that they like from our Bible. So they can say it all they want. They do plenty of cherry picking on their own. So for now, if I can encourage you guys, some of you guys are feeling right now the need to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Some of you guys know that he's who you need and he's who you want. If I could encourage you just right now to tell him that you believe in him, that you believe he died on the cross for you, he rose again from the dead three days later, and that he wants to be your Lord, your God, and your Savior right now. And if you want a prayer to follow like a model prayer, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me for my sins. I believe you died on the cross and rose again for me. Please forgive me right now. Please be my God, my Master, and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God heard it. He, he, he was right there on the spot. If you meant it, he forgave you of your sins. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Welcome to the church. Welcome to the family. It is good to have you. You're going to have some bumpy roads ahead. Your life's not going to be perfect from this point on. But you're going to have a peace like you never had before. You're going to have a love like you never had before. It's going to be rough, but you're going to make it. Just make sure you lean on your God. Make sure you read this Bible a little bit every day. Get to know what your God thinks and feels. Find a group of people, a church, who believes that Jesus is God, who believes that the Bible is the Word of God, who will encourage you and strengthen you and befriend you and help you along this Christian path. And shoot up a prayer to this God. You know, when the day is good, say, thank you, God, for this day. When the day sucks, say, God, this day sucks. I need your help. He hears those prayers. They count. Those quick one-liners, those five-seconders, they count. God cares, He hears, and He answers. Guys, thank you very much for giving me the time of day and for watching this video. I love you, and God bless.